chapter eight, the title of chapter eight is America secedes from the empire. So finally, the Revolutionary War is beginning. We uh, ended last chapter, chapter seven, talking about the uh, defeat or, you know, well, the, actually the defeat, the colonists defeating the, the Redcoats in that battle of Lexington and Concord, preventing the Redcoats from being able to reach Concord and get the weapons and preventing them from being able to first go and get Hancock and Adams uh, in Lexington. But then what happened at the end is the, as we, as we talked about in the last chapter, the colonists came in droves to Concord and were able to meet the Redcoats there and uh, actually stop them from crossing the North Bridge. Not only that, but they pushed them all the way back to Boston. So I used the example last chapter of um, Boston being Salinas, Lexington being Marina and Concord being Seaside. So that's about the distance between the three towns. So imagine thousands and thousands of, uh, they don't even know exactly how many, but uh, thousands of, of militia there at uh, Concord that, that, you know, were so forceful that they got the Redcoats to retreat all the way back to Boston, which is equivalent going from Seaside back it up all the way to Salinas. So pretty impressive uh, movements by the militia. What the militia did then was they drove them all the way to the sea. And what I mean by that is they, they drove them all the way to, to where Boston Harbor is and they surrounded them in the hills that surround Boston Harbor. The uh, militia were up there, they were armed, they pointed their guns down at them, and there was like a, a standoff. The, the Redcoats didn't have anywhere to go because the ships weren't there. Um, the Americans were up in the hills. Could the Americans have attacked? Yes, but they had limited resources. On average, every man had approximately 11 shots out of their musket. And the reason that they, they it wasn't a, a supply of musket balls, it was actually a supply of gunpowder. They were in desperate need of gunpowder. Um, they were, they really needed more, more weapons, of course. But the big thing was at the time that, you know, you needed one packet of gunpowder per shot. That's how they did it back then. So um, there, that's why the standstill, that's why the, the, you know, exact, that, that's the reason why, the militia didn't you know, rush down the hill and attack the Redcoats and defeat them and obliterate them because they couldn't. So anyways, uh, we discussed the first Continental Congress, uh, in, as it was a, which was a reaction to the uh, intolerable acts. And they decided they were going to meet again within one year if the intolerable acts were not uh, repealed. But then within a matter of eight months, nine months, is when Lexington and Concord happened. So they quickly got together a second Continental Congress, and this is gonna become even more important than the first Continental Congress. They met in Philadelphia again, just like they did in the first Continental Congress on May 10th, 1775. They had no real intention of independence. The majority of men that were at second Continental Congress merely wanted to get along with England. They wanted to address the king uh, and, and say, this, th these are the reasons we're upset. And they called it redress of grievances. Air them out, air out their grievances. Say, these are our problems. Uh, don't do this to us and we'll be loyal British subjects. So the majority of, of men that were there at Second Continental Congress didn't want to separate. They're not there yet. The accomplishments of Second Con Continental Congress are really important. The first one is they adopted measures to raise money and to create an army and a navy. Right now, this so-called battle, it's only been Lexington and Concord really, was, was fought with militia. And again, as I said in the last chapter, you never really knew about the militia, how many were gonna show up, case in point, right? Look at Lexington, they had 70 or 80 show up. Some estimates at Concord say it was anywhere from five to 7,000 that showed up there. So you never really knew how many were gonna show up and how many were gonna leave. And that's going to be a problem um, in Boston as, as the weeks turn into months and they 
got their weapons pointed down at, at the red coats and, and there's going to be a lot of uh, militia that are going to say, I got to go home. I got to see my family. I got to take care of them. I got to make sure they're safe and I got to plant crops or I got to harvest crops. So they had things to do. So people would inevitably leave and there was no repercussions to leaving because it was a, a militia instead of an, of an official army. So now when you create an official army and Navy, you, you can't leave. Um, and you know how many are there, you know numbers all the time. So that was big. The other really important uh, decision made by Second Continental Congress was the selection of George Washington as the commander in chief of the Continental Army. You know, we know George Washington from his days as the, a survey, land surveyor involved in the French and Indian War. And, uh, you know, he, he is the most widely recognized uh, figure in, in Virginia, but not necessarily uh, the colonies. I mean, this battle, Lexington and Concord, most of the stuff that's going on is in Massachusetts. So who in the heck even in Massachusetts knew who George Washington was? They didn't. So it was controversial picking someone from all the way down south from Virginia to be the leader of the Continental Congress. Make no mistake about it, it was purely political. It's a political move by Congress. They wanted to get Virginia involved in this. Why wouldn't you want Virginia involved in it? They have the most money and they have the most population at the time. So you want them to be involved. So pick a leader from that colony. And that's why they picked George Washington. So purely political. But they had no idea what a good decision it was going to be. At the end of the day, George Washington is going to lose more battles than he's going to win, but it doesn't matter how many you, it, it's, it's not the battles, it's the war. The Americans win the war and he, he emerges as a hero. But yes, he does lose more battles than he wins. And we've already seen him retreat from the battlefield at Fort Duquesne, but he did it because he needed to do it, as we'll find out here in this war also. So George Washington, big important pick for Second Continental Congress. Now, here's another uh, pretty lucky occurrence uh, during the war was the capturing of Fort Ticonderoga and Crown Point along Lake Champlain. Fort Ticonderoga, Fort Ticonderoga and Crown Point were both British uh, military posts and they were arsenals. So they had a lot of their weapons. They had gunpowder, they had cannons, they had muskets and a host of other, other things that, they, that the uh, col colonists would want. It was May 10th, 1775 when Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold both had the idea at the same time. They were traveling north to Fort Ticonderoga to take those two forts, thinking that they could do something for the colonial cause. They are not part of the new Continental Army. Um, it, it, it's, it's May of 1775 when this is happening. So, you know, from the here, the May 10th, 1775 is also the day that Second Continental Congress met. You can see the date right there. So they were not under orders from Second Continental Congress because they're meeting. They did it purely on their own. Uh, did they want glory for this? Of course they did. Uh, were they jealous of each other? Yes, but they met along the way, both having the same idea. They didn't arrange for the meeting. They actually were like, hey, what are you doing here? And they went back and forth and they both decided, hey, we want to do the same thing. Let's do it together. And it wasn't a perfect um, merger, but the two sides agreed to go take Fort Ticonderoga and Crown Point, And they successfully did that. Uh, a little bit here that I got this out of uh, yeah, out of a, a book that I read recently about um, the Re American Revolution, and I, I pulled a piece out of it uh, on Ticonderoga and Crown Point I thought was interesting, and I'll read it to you here. Almost 50 sleepy redcoats had surrendered without a fight as had a smaller detachment of nearby Crown Point. The captured booty included some 200 iron cannons, 10 tons of musket balls, 30,000 flints, and 49 gallons of rum. Much of it was consumed by the men to celebrate their victory. Two men led the raid in an unsteady collaboration. A strapping, profane, sometimes farmer, lead miner, lead, sorry, lead miner and philosopher named Ethan Allen, and a short, gifted Connecticut apothecary, merchant, prince, and hothead named Benedict Arnold, who had been given a colonel's commission by Joseph Warren and whose long nose and dark hair caused him to resemble a raven in human form. 
how the capture how the captured munitions would be transported from the remote fortress remained to be seen. But no one who knew Allen and Arnold or knew of them doubted that both would be heard from again. For now, the acts of burglar, burglarious enterprise in one British writer's description gave the American control not only of Ticonderoga, but the most strategic inland position on the continent, but also of the long blue teardrop of Lake Champlain, the tr uh, traditional invasion route into or out of Canada. So as you can see in this map right here where uh, Ticonderoga and Crown Point are, this is like they called it the uh, gateway to Canada. So control Ticonderoga and Crown Point and control the gateway to Canada. And Americans believed that because they had these two forts, they didn't have to worry about being attacked by the British and they could go take Canada, which they're going to attempt to do. We'll talk about that here soon. But uh, yeah, Ticonderoga and Crown Point victories brought all kinds of gunpowder, brought weapons. Here's some of the cannons, uh, the size of some of these cannons that they took. Uh, the big heavy ones, they had about, you know, 15 to 20 of these big heavy cannons. And they were, as, as the, uh, what I just read to you, they were talking about how are we going to get this over to Boston? That was the goal is to get all this material over to Boston where the fighting was occurring. They made the decision to wait until winter time. The reason that they wanted to wait until winter time is because they knew they had to transport these big heavy cannons and you couldn't just roll them in the dirt. You needed to put them on sleds and you needed to be able to get these across rivers. And that's why they waited until the snow. When the snow hit, they took the cannons and they went up and over mountains to get these all the way to Boston. And we'll talk about how that happened. Okay, so in June of, of 1775 at the Battle of Bunker Hill, this was, this was probably, I would consider it to be the first major battle, even though some would consider Lexington and Conquer to be major, but um, it, and they were, but Battle of Bunker Hill is, once, once this war is on, it's the first major battle. And it happened in June of 1775. And as you can imagine, it's one month approximately after the meeting that occurred at, for Second Continental Congress. So this battle is not being fought by this newly created army. They haven't even started yet. This is, again, militia. Now, remember, these are the men who fought at Lexington and Concord. These are the men that chased the Redcoats all the way back to Boston and then surrounded them. And they've been for months surrounding them. And as I said earlier, some of the militia are starting to leak out and go home. So they knew they had to do something and they had to do something fast. So they decided to uh, go and fortify Bunker Hill. They actually fortified Breed's Hill, which is a, a hill that was right next to it. So it, but still, this battle is called the Battle of Bunker Hill, even though it, didn't really, it wasn't really fought on Bunker Hill. It was fought on Breed's Hill. They fortified the hill. What does it mean to fortify the hill? They dug trenches. Um, they, uh, you know, put, they filled up huge wine barrels with uh, dirt, and they put them up there so they could hide behind them when they're shooting. And then when all else, everything else is, goes bad, you could roll these big barrels down the hill, in which they eventually did. Um, so they prepared all night long. They set diversionary fires. They, they uh, shot cannon off at, the, at some of the areas down below where the Redcoats were, tried to divert their attention. And in the meantime, they fortified that hill. Well, when the British woke up the next morning and looked up and saw all those guns and cannons pointed down at them, even though there weren't that many, enough to scare them. And remember, the guns from Ticonderoga and Crown Point weren't going to come until the wintertime. So they're not there. So every, every man, but the British doesn't, don't know this, every militia has approximately 11 shots per man. That's 11 packets of gunpowder, and that's it. So they, were, they had to be really, really efficient with, with their uh, shots. And uh, the Redcoats, once they saw all, everything pointed down, and I said, we're going to take that hill. So they, they got their first wave together and they walked up the hill and much to their surprise, there was no shots raining down on them. They thought for sure it was going to happen right away. And they kept going up the hill and going up the hill. And, uh, you know, you could see uh, these two sketches here. You have the men that are behind the breastwork here that they created through the night. 
you have the red coats that are walking up the hill. They're not getting fired on at all until they got really close. And it's, and it's one of these commanders here, a guy by the name of uh, Prescott. And he, he uttered the famous words, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes, which was really, really good advice because the colonial muskets couldn't hit, hit anything unless you were close enough to see the whites of their eyes. So yeah, the, the, then when they opened fire, they mowed them down. The first wave was mowed down and then some of them retreated. A second wave formed down at the bottom of the hill, ready to go up. So the British started walking up again. Again, no fire firing at them. And once they could see the whites of their eyes, the colonials opened fire on them and mowed the second wave down. A third wave came up and uh, you could see here in this, this painting right here, you have the first wave, you have the second wave and the third wave that's forming men getting off ships. This is gonna be the third wave. The third wave is gonna eventually take the hill. Right, they're gonna be the ones that, that eventually go and, and you know, because the colonists run out of ammunition. That's the only reason they lose this thing is because they run out of ammunition. Here's some diversionary fires that were set to uh, take the attention of the Redcoats away from what was going on all night long fortifying the hill. So the third wave eventually, it, it got down to hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the third wave eventually takes the hill. But take a look at these numbers. In the battle, there are 1,054 British casualties, uh, and the Americans, 441. So the Americans suffered half the casualties that the British did. So the battle was won by the Redcoats because they took the hill. That was their objective, take the hill, they took the hill. But at, for sure, with unacceptable losses, when you lose twice as many as the, the, uh, the, uh, the colonists did, you know, it's probably not a good thing and they weren't really satisfied with that. But they did take the hill nonetheless. But pretty much it's on after this. Um, I, I came across this picture here, and this is Boston Harbor today, taken from the top of Breed's Hill. So if you were to go to Boston, they have a monument up there where you could see where the battle occurred, and this is what they were looking down on. Um, obviously, none of the buildings or anything were there, but you could, you could see um, the harbor. Um, you could see the Red, Sco Red Sox Stadium in the distance right up over here. So pretty cool picture, I thought, and gives you a perspective of what they're looking down at and what it looks like now. And there's the monument that's on Breed's Hill today. The, uh, the British now, um, you know, one of the things that I mentioned earlier was that they had hired soldiers to help them. Um, and they're not fighting at Bunker Hill yet, but they will be fighting in many other battles. Uh, German soldiers that would go fight for any country as long as they paid them. Uh, the Hessians, they were called, numbered 30,000. There were 30,000 Hessians that fought for the uh, British during the war. So that's a big advantage for them, no doubt. Uh, because the Americans were able to take Ticonderoga and Crown Point, that gave them the opportunity, or at least they thought, the opportunity to go take Canada. So any, any talk of the Americans fighting only a defensive battle were ruined by the Americans' dis decision to go and offensively go take Canada and make Canada the 14th colony, which would eventually be the 14th state. If successful, would have been part of uh, the United States today, I believe. Um, and there, was, there, were, there were victories, right? The Americans did win at Montreal, but then turned around and lost at Quebec, which they would have had to win at Quebec in order to win the, the war. Uh, but the reason it failed is because of the cold winters in Canada. The Americans didn't really uh, quite know how cold it was gonna be. And there was starvation and there was, uh, death because of it because of exposure this battle was fought by the continental army this is the first battle fought by the continental army and they were not successful so it's a bad start to to the war for the continental army uh evacuation day in boston is the day that finally after the winter um the guns cannons arrived from fort ticonderoga and crown point the guy who was in charge of moving all those, his name was Henry Knox. Fort Knox in Kentucky is named after him. He will in the future be the United States' first Secretary of War. Very smart man. Um, and he was the one that came up with a plan to use sleds to take all the weapons over. And they finally did get them there. And once they got the weapons there, they set them up in an area called Dorchester Heights that surrounds Boston. There are hills that are above uh, Bunker and Breed's Hill. 
and they pointed these weapons down at the Redcoats a second time. This time, the Redcoats left. They said, we're not going to have another Bunker Hill type situation. They got in their boats and left. They called it evacuation day because there was celebration. The Americans truly believed at this time that they had won the war uh, because the Redcoats left. But people like George Washington, commander in chief of the New Continental Army said, eh, I don't think that this thing's over. He really felt like the, the British were gonna come again and they were gonna come somewhere else. And his guess was New York. He believed that, that, that they would try to take over New York Harbor. Knowing that they have the strongest Navy in the world, he felt like they were gonna, that, that would be the port to take over. They thought, could it be Philadelphia? Could it be Charleston, South Carolina? Could it be New York? And he picked New York, and he's absolutely going to be correct. They knew they probably weren't going to come back to Boston. Literature played a big role in, in uh, turning the tide towards uh, separation from England because, as I said earlier, the majority of people were against going for freedom and independence. And I, and I told you this last chapter, and I'm going to tell you again. At the end of the day, though, the American Revolution is a minority movement. The majority of people in the United States did not want anything to do with separation. They, they were loyal British subjects and they wanted to re remain loyal British subjects, but they wanted better treatment. Uh, but there's a growing group led by people like Thomas Paine, who was a British born colonist. He came to America and to him, it's plain and simple, or as he put it, common sense that there should be separation. He wrote, this pamphlet that Americans bought millions of copies of because that's what you did back then. There's no TV, there's no radio, there's no internet. There's books and there's pamphlets and essays that come out. And you wanna know about what's going on, you want a, a deep read into what's going on, you would read things like Common Sense. And millions of copies were sold and it said to Americans, look, it's Common Sense. How can an island 3,000 miles away control this land here? go for it. Let's go for freedom and independence. But still there was a lot of hemming and hawing back and forth. Second Continental Congress was some were, some weren't. And it wasn't until this guy right here, Richard Henry Lee, who was a representative from Virginia, stood up in Congress and said, enough messing around here. Let's go for it. He, he, got up, he stood up and said, resolved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to their British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. In a nutshell, what Richard Henry Lee's resolution is stating is that let's go for freedom and independence. Let's not go for better treatment, redress of grievances. Let's go for it. Let's make a decision now. This waffling back and forth isn't getting it done. So he called for a vote and they voted and they voted uh, 12 to zero to one, 12, four, zero against and one abstention from New York. New York, New York abstained from the voting. And uh, you could have heard a pin drop after Richard Henry Lee's resolution. I'll, I'll show you something, I'll, I'll share something with you in class uh, on that. But uh, you could have heard pin drop because they were really, really scared at this point. They're like, what did we just vote on? They're, they're now, they now know that what they're doing in the eyes of the British is treasonous. And if they lost, they'd all be hanging from trees. And uh, you know, they're, they were afraid. So once they did this, they decided, okay, now we need to write something up to explain to the rest of the world what we're doing. So in response to Lee's resolution and the vote, the Second Continental Congress hired Thomas Jefferson, who was at the time only 33 years old, very young, to write a Declaration of Independence. And uh, he was, they said, you know, there's a lot of arguing back and forth. How can you have a guy only 33 years old with not enough life experience write this very important document? So they said, all right, he'll be assisted by John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. Um, and they both helped him as they were proofreaders and they suggested things. And together the three of them wrote 
the document that we know as the Declaration of Independence that declared our independence from Great Britain and told the rest of the world, look, this is why we're doing it. It's a list of grievances and, and against the British that we have. And, and these are the reasons why we're separating. And here's a John Trumbull painting of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. John Hancock, who was the president of Second Continental Congress, was the first to sign the document. And if somebody asks you currently today, if for your John Hancock, you may have heard that before, that means your autograph. If, if they want you to sign something, can I have your John Hancock? The, um, the, the reason is because he was an important signature because he's a president, but he also, you know, wrote it big. So the pre so the King could see it without his spectacles is what John Hancock said because there were people who were afraid to sign this thing and signed it so you couldn't recognize their name because they knew that it was a treasonous act. John Hancock proudly put his name on there in big letters. And, you know, he, he, he said, this is me, this is who I am. And he owned it, basically. The preamble or the beginning, the intro to the Declaration of Independence says this, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the cause which impel them to separation. Maybe the longest uh, sentence in, in history right there, but basically what Jefferson is saying is, we're gonna tell you why we're separating. And he goes on, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And uh, basically he's, he's saying that, you know, that all men are created equal, which was ironic because Thomas Jefferson had over 100 slaves. Um, Jefferson was an interesting figure in history because he often sometimes say one thing and do something completely different. And this is a great example of it. He's talking about all men are created equal, yet he has, you know, 150 slaves at, at home. So, yeah, there's a, there's the, this is a pretty impressive uh, document. I've seen this document at the uh, Library of Congress, and it is not the actual Declaration of Independence that you see um, in Washington, D.C. It, 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 it's, it's the rough draft. And uh, it, all these things crossed out. You could see where Adams and, and uh, Ben Franklin would go in there and correct it. So it's pretty, pretty cool to see. I thought this was kind of funny. I found this on the internet. Crap, that's due tomorrow. Thomas Jefferson, July 3rd, 1776. You know, because July 4th, 1776, it was due. 